So um, before I give the virtual floor to our speaker, uh, allow me to introduce him to you. Uh, Nicholas Walker teaches ESL at Ahansa College. He has a master's degree in applied linguistics with a focus on AI-assisted language learning. Uh, he's also worked on many different projects, which he will uh, be talking to you about um, in his own introduction and during his presentation. Nick prepared today's webinar in collaboration with Daniel Bulgis, uh, who's also an ESL teacher. He teaches at Cégep du Vieux Montréal, and he has been a longtime member of the ESL coordination subcommittee and the SPEAK steering committee. Unfortunately, Dan couldn't be present today as he is teaching at this time, uh, but I'm sure uh, Nick will do a fantastic job on uh, presenting their topic. Both Dan and Nicholas are award-winning teachers with a passion for pedagogy. So I uh, wish you a wonderful webinar um, and please do not hesitate to use the chat and the Q&A functions. Over to you, Nick. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Okay, I'm gonna share my slide. Um, will they be able to see my face in the corner? They can see everybody, right? If they choose. So I'll start my slides and share with sound. Yes, sound is already selected. And here are my slides. <clears throat> well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Accelerating Learning with the Social Brain. My name is Nicholas Walker. Dan Bouleris could not be here today, um, so I'll be doing it alone, which is unfortunate. Dan's a fun person. If you haven't met him, I recommend you track him down and say hello. All right, so just quickly about me. I teach English as a second language at Ahunsic College in Montreal. I've won a number of prizes for my teaching, and I've been working on two projects um, over the past, what, 13 years, the Virtual Writing Tutor and labo.anglais.com. And, and you'll see some examples of the innovations that I've created using Labo d'Anglais uh, towards the end of my talk. So stick around for that, please. Before I get into the talk, um, I'll just tell you my plan. And my plan is, <laughs> teachers, I'm going to give you some homework. Don't worry, it's painless. You'll like it, but there's some homework for you to do. I'm going to talk about the traditional model of teaching, uh, some which is based upon some false assumptions and therefore has some negative consequences. And then I'm going to talk about some evidence of acceleration from the neuroscience of uh, the social brain. And then <clears throat> we're practical people, so we should get to some practical implications for pedagogy across all disciplines, not just English as a second language, but every discipline. And then I'm gonna talk to you about some innovations that involve social artificial intelligence and social um, instructional technology uh, projects that I've developed for my students. And then, of course, I'll give some information about how you can contact me because I want to keep the conversation going if you're interested too. All right, so first, your homework is this. During the presentation, as you hear the ideas come up and the concepts, I would like you to think about how you can share these ideas with a colleague. That is to say, I want you to prepare to explain the ideas in this presentation to one of your colleagues. Right? So you're going to think about how you would explain it to that person. Now think about that person. What, are, what motivates them? What do they do in the classroom? What are their attitudes? What's their disposition? Do you think they'll be offended if you make suggestions to them? Or do you think they'll welcome new ideas about pedagogy. I want you to have a clear idea of that person. And um, to that end, I have put a link to the uh, slides that I'm using today and the video clips. It's all uploaded. 
uh, to our SharePoint system at uh, Hunsett College, and you'll be able to download them and use them. And I encourage you to present this presentation as your own, I'm not claiming a copyright here. Uh, share as much as you like, you're free to use it as you wish. Okay, so let's get into the traditional model of uh, the traditional model is this. We assume that we as teachers possess an expert knowledge, which we transfer to our students who are novices and don't know as much as we do. But what's interesting is though we've been operating under this assumption for at least 100 years or more, by the time a child turns 18, he or she has spent 20,000 hours in school. And surprisingly, when you talk to them about what they've learned over those 20,000 hours, they don't seem to know very much, right? Not a lot of it seems to stick. So maybe we're doing something wrong, or maybe we could do something better. Is school learning inefficient? I think it is. And can we make it more efficient? I think we can. All right. Now, when we talk about learning, we need to think about the brain, right? And we have big brains. We have the largest brains uh, for our size of all the species, right? Of all the species that we know of. And we see a high correlation between brain size and social complexity. That is to say, the more complex an animal's social group, the larger its brain. And humans have the biggest brains and the most complex social groups. So I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, chimpanzees have social groups of about 15 members. They live in a little troop of 15. And because of that, they need to keep track of little dyads, little one-to-one -one relationships, chimp-to-chimp -chimp relationships. Uh, to the order of about 100 relationships. That's what they have to manage in their memory. Who's uh, got greater status, who's got lower status, who uh, belongs to whom, uh, who's aggressive, who's not aggressive, etc. Now, humans, we have for past million years lived in groups of 150. That means that our brains must track dyad relationships of human to human relationships on the order of 10,000 possible pairs, one to one. So obviously we need a bigger brain to track these kinds of uh, relationships. So just from the outset, I want to emphasize, we have not evolved to remember information. We have evolved to live in groups. And that's the, the central thesis of this talk today. We have evolved to live in groups and we are the way that we are because of that evolutionary fact. All right, so we need our big brains to keep track of other people and to make sense of what they're thinking. You know you can do it. You can tell when somebody's in a good mood or a bad mood. You know what motivates them. You know their goals, their thoughts their feelings, their dispositions. You, you already know a lot about the people around you. So I just want to emphasize that our brains are optimized to remember this information um, because it's relevant to the social context in which we live. But consider this. Our classrooms are not optimized for social exchanges, are they? In fact, when I walk down the hall, I can hear teachers saying, shh, Pay attention, be quiet in the back there, listen. Socializing in class is discouraged. That's the truth of it. Students are arranged into rank and file, right? Rows and columns. And the purpose of this is clear, is to isolate each student from each other. We don't want them talking. We want them separate from each other. And because socializing is uh, considered a problem, in our classrooms, we tend to stop it. And the reason is that we believe that socializing interferes with the ability of students to, to uh, encode information into their long-term memory. 
So it interferes with the transfer of information from the front of the room to the back, and it interferes with the encoding of that information. Okay, so now I wanna tell you, the good news is we have two brains, not really two brains, we have two memory encoding systems. Uh, we encode information in two possible ways. According to Lieberman in 2012, and then explored further in his book, 2013. Um, we have the information brain, which focuses on facts and discrete information. And we have the social brain, which encodes information in a social context. Now, teachers try to suppress so social interaction in the classroom. Why? We're trying to enhance information transfer, and we're trying to help students quietly encode the information in their long-term memory. So we do this by suppressing the social brain. But this might be a mistake. And there's good reason to believe it's a mistake. And I want to show you some evidence. Now, in 1980, that's 43 years ago, Hamilton, Katz, and Lehrer performed a study in New Haven, Connecticut. And what they did is they collected a group of participants from their university and told them to read statements about everyday events in the past tense. And I'll give you some examples. For example, washed the dishes, cleaned up the house, read the evening newspaper, swept the floor, opened the windows. You get the idea, just the verb and the complement or the, uh, the object. All right, now they split these participants into two groups. Group number one, they asked them to memorize the events for a test later. They were explicit. There's going to be a test, memorize this information. And in group number two, they didn't tell them there was a test. In fact, they didn't mention anything about a test. They said, imagine the person who participated in each of these events. Think of that person. Right? And then afterwards, we'll ask you to share your impressions of this person. So two different thinking processes. Well, who did better on the surprise test afterwards? Because both groups did the test. But it was the group that was asked to think about the social context of the events who remembered more. And not a little bit more. They remembered 25% more. Now, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, think about your paycheck. Um, I teach in the SEJAP with a master's degree, I make about $100,000. 25% more would be $125,000 a year. That's significant, right? So we're not talking trivial differences, we're talking big differences. All right, so why is it that the people who are asked to give impressions about the people who did the events did better? Well, our brains are optimized to remember information that is relevant to a social context. Now, it shouldn't come as any surprise to you that stories are more memorable, more interesting, and easier to understand than lists of facts and argumentation, right? Remember that when we tell a story, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about entities, but usually people and their the events that they participate in and of course their motivations to participate in these events so these stories that we share all day every day how's your weekend what you do today they're easier to remember why because not only are they organized in a causal chain this happened and this happened and this happened so you can figure out what happened before because you know what happened later but also because the events often happen because of the disposition and motivation of the characters in the story right so they're easier to remember stories are more interesting when we ask students in a second language class what they prefer whether to talk about controversies and make arguments and defend them in a debate or whether to talk about personal growth stories Pupor in 2014 at uh, the university of urbana champagne champagne university of illinois found them much more interesting students prefer stories in the classroom and they're also easier to understand right 
when you uh, arrange things in a causal chain, people understand them better than when they're arranged into argumentation and, uh, and uh, lists of facts and presentations uh, in a boardroom. Now, um, in the slide, I've given you the, the references and you can go and check these things out for yourself. There's another study. And it's a study, again, in 1980, 43 years ago, this time with Barg and Schul, they asked students, instead of learning about narrative events, they asked them to remember scientific information, a list of facts. And here's what they found. Group one was told to memorize the information for a test, just like the last study. But group two was told to prepare to teach the information to a colleague or to a friend. Right? So one was told to prepare to memorize for a test. The second one was told to prepare to teach it to someone else. Now, they never got to teach this person, but this is what they were told to do instead of memorizing for a test. What happened? Both groups did a test, and the group that was asked to prepare to teach others did significantly better on the test. Why? The act of thinking about the needs of others they need what they know, what they don't know, what they need to know, engages the social brain and leads to better encoding of memories into the long-term memory. This is the neuroscience. This is the evidence. It's clear. We are evolved to think about others and to remember that information for the long-term. Now, there's more, there's more evidence. And, uh, and here's a surprising bit of evidence. Uh, when, when you get students to teach each other in small groups, we call that reciprocal teaching. Enseignement or apprentissage reciproque, something like that. Uh, we see a 37% acceleration of learning when we get students to teach each other in small groups. So now think about this. You're driving down the highway at 100 kilometers an hour and somebody passes you at 137 kilometers an hour. That is significantly faster. You, you'll feel it. Your car will shake as the person passes you. 37% is an enormous improvement and acceleration in learning. When you get students to tutor each other, there's a 28% acceleration. With cooperative learning, where they work on a project together, we see a 27% acceleration in learning. And if a person simply has a friend in class, they will learn 27% more than they would if they're isolated without any friends. And in fact, what we see is students without friends in a classroom tend to be less engaged and perform much worse than the rest of the group. So this should tell us that when you say week one or week two, we don't have time for the ice breaking activity where we get to know each other, that in fact, you're doing students are tremendous disservice because friends accelerate learning. And I got this information from uh, John Hattie, 2009, a visible learning where he studied over 800 meta-analyses. And this is statistically uh, very strong evidence. Okay, so check this out. This is what we do. This is what we do in our uh, language learning classes. Okay, get to know each other, icebreaker activity. Good morning, my name is Jane. Hello, nice to meet you. And then the second week, we give them enormous amounts of vocabulary or grammar or dry information to memorize. So it's a little funny cartoon that illustrates the point. Okay. Now look, uh, this information brain and the social brain, they are complementary in nature. That is to say, they do not operate simultaneously. When one is active, the other one is inactive. All right. So, for instance, when the information brain is active, the social brain is inactive. And when the social brain is active, the information brain is inactive. They cannot operate at the same time. So, here's an interesting question and for you, and I'd like you to attempt to answer it. Put your answer in the chat. What do you think about when you aren't thinking about anything in particular? You're in a chair, 
You're not thinking about any problems. You just relax your mind, close your eyes. What thoughts tend to drift into your head? What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything? Well, um, Lieberman did the study, put people into an fMRI machine, and he asked them to do that, and he noted where the brain lit up from uh, activation from, from energy, this fMRI scan. And then he asked them to think about some information, and he saw where the brain lit up, and then he asked them to think about the people in their lives. And lo and behold, their brains lit up in the same pattern when they weren't thinking about anything at all as when they were thinking about people. That is to say, we think about people as a kind of default reflex. The default state of rest for our brain is the social brain. The social brain is active by default. Now, evolution obviously made this choice, right? Right? Why? Obviously, sometime in our ancestral past, thinking about people kept us alive or kept us reproducing. And not thinking about people led to our demise. So why is an active social brain the default state? Well, obviously, it's evolution. OK, so there's all the evidence. There's the argument. Let's look at the implications for pedagogy. Let's say you teach history. How do you teach it? Well, I have a daughter, she's 17 years old. She uh, just finished high school. In high school, the way they taught her was they put up a PowerPoint slide and they left it there while the students copied down the information from the PowerPoint into their copy books. They took, the teacher reduced the complex historical events to key information points of who, when, where, the treaty, and the consequence. And he asked, he asked the students to memorize that information. But shh, no talking. That's how we do it. That's how we teach history. But think about what we could do. We could say, imagine Wolf or Montcalm or some historical figure, and imagine what they were thinking as they stood there on the plains of Abraham, or they stood there on the prow of their ship. What were they thinking? What were they feeling at that time and place? Use the date, the place, and uh, the person, and then talk about the consequences. Write a story. In this way, we get the students to engage their social brain in what otherwise would be a very dry subject. What about writing courses? Now, I've taken many different writing courses. One thing that teachers have told me is uh, learn the rules. Don't use passives. Passives should not be used. Uh, don't join sentences with commas. That's called a comma splice. Don't do it. Make sure you have a strong thesis statement. You should have good, clear topic sentences at the beginning of your paragraphs. Um, make sure you're ready for publication by using APA and MLA referencing and citation style. And memorize these rules for later. You're going to need them. That's how we teach writing oftentimes. But uh, what we really should be doing is saying, think about your poor reader. Your reader has to read what you've written. How can you make your text easier to read? Well, first of all, passive sentences slow you down. You have to think about what was the agent and you, know, you have to switch things around in your head. It slows you down when you read, you can measure this. So think about your reader and try to eliminate anything that would make it difficult for them to read. And, and try to make it more persuasive and more believable by using references and citations. Right, so we can improve writing courses and engage the social brain in this way. What about grammar? Fill in the blanks, memorize the rules. Um, I often speak to Francophones about how my kids are learning French in school and they tell me that French is a very difficult language, very difficult. You have to learn the grammar. You have to do these exercises. And so this is how grammar is taught in schools. But what if we were to say, to students, write a story, write a first person fictional narrative, use the target structures, use the groupe de nom and the groupe de verbe, and, and use all that. But 
tell a story that's going to entertain the members of your group. Try to think of what motivates your character. Ask the members of your group, what will your character do next? Engage them into thinking about people. Engage the social brain. The grammar and the rules will follow. It'll, they'll become relevant because of the act of communicating. Math and science. There are no people in math and science. You can't make a story about that, but you know what you can do? You can identify the key concepts of formulas in that textbook, and you can test them. Um, there are 48 cabbages and four boxes. How many cabbages fit in each box, right? Or maybe we could ask students to identify those key concepts that their classmates are likely to find difficult. Think about your classmate. What are they going to struggle with? OK, now prepare a lesson to teach your little group or to teach your classmate. And take turns in your group preparing lessons from the textbook. The research says this will accelerate learning by 37%. OK, what about everything else? Now, uh, colleagues, dear colleagues, this, I think, is of profound importance. Usually what we say to students, and I see this walking down the hallway, I see my colleagues teaching, standing at the chalkboard, listen to the teacher, take notes, and then remember that information for the test. But you know what we could do? Listen to the teacher, take notes. Why? Because in a minute, I'm going to ask you to explain what I just said to your neighbor sitting next to you. In this way, they have a purpose for taking the information and they're thinking about what their neighbor needs to know. It's also a very useful comprehension check. You can walk around the classroom uh, saying to students, uh, any problems, any difficulty? Oh yeah, we both missed this part of the explanation. Could you explain it to us again? So it, it's useful for other reasons, but primarily I recommend it for engaging the social brain. All right, now, now some <laughs> teachers are gonna tell me, look, Nick, uh, nice, nice, nice idea, but it's not possible. It's not gonna work. Look at my lab. Students are physically separated from each other. Look at them, there are dividers, metal sheets that physically separate one from the next. Can't make that more social than, uh, than this. And what about when they go home? They work in isolation in their bedrooms, at their desks. There's no, I can't make that social, can we? It's impossible. It's a fool's errand. Okay, well, I'm gonna show you some innovations. First of all, is an AI powered email exchange that I developed for a colleague named uh, Alexander, well, Alexandre Mesquita. He teaches at the University of Sherbrooke. And he came to me recently and said, Nick, we have a problem. My students, uh, they have a lot of support to pass the French test that they need in order to get teacher certification to teach at primary and secondary school. They're, they're novice teachers, pre-service, and they have a test in French, and there's a lot of support for that. But there's no support for the English test called an EETC test. Can you help me? Sure, I said. And so here's what I did, is I created a robot, um, so the teacher in training watches a video of a robot inviting an email exchange. And then the teacher in training, the, the student, writes the email and then submits it to the system. And my AI system on labodanglais.com scores the email, uh, shows the errors and the corrections, and then generates a dynamic reply uh, using chat GPT technology. And so, in fact, they get a meaningful reply from Mrs. Mesquita, and I'll show you the video. Here we go. Get ready. If ever there's a problem with my son's behavior, or if he has forgotten to do his homework, please send me an email to let me know. Watch as I enter an example of an email to a parent called Mrs. Mesquita with errors in it. Click Save Changes. And in just a couple of seconds, the system highlights your errors in red and corrects them for you. Notice the corrections highlighted in green. 
the system even generates a meaningful reply from Mrs. Mosquita to simulate a real email exchange with a parent. So I'll just tell you that the, it doesn't matter what you write to Miss Mosquita, the system understands what you've written and formulates a reply based on, on your message. So it becomes very interactive and it feels like you're communicating with a person, but you're not. You're doing homework on a computer with a machine. If ever. Okay. Um, so that's good for writing. And there are many examples I can show you for writing, including argumentation, literary analysis, uh, film uh, projects, all kinds of different things, but you get the idea. What about speaking? Speaking is more difficult, right? Well, here's an AI powered monologue. So what you'll see is the robot. The student watches a video of the robot who asks a series of questions all at once. And then the student records a video, a monologue, answering the questions and then submits it. And then the system evaluates the video by extracting the audio, transcribing it, checking it for errors and checking it for target structures, etc. And so the student gets uh, meaningful feedback in that way. So, so check it out. Tell me about your neighborhood. Where do you live? Do you live in a house or an apartment? What can you see from your window? Is your street busy or quiet? I live in Chambly. He am in a, a house with my family of four people. From my windows, he can see the house in front. My state is very quiet. No car pass me. I didn't understand your answer. Make sure to say, I live in a house or an apartment. From my window, I can see. My street is busy or my street is quiet. Try again. Speak as clearly as you can. Okay, so I blurred out the video of the girl because she hasn't given me permission, but you get the idea. She gets the questions, she records herself, and then the robot replies with a video telling her what she needs to work on. Okay. Um, that's fine for monologues. What about a dialogue? Maybe we can get them students to practice speaking with someone else. Well, here what you'll see is two videos run at the same time. You have the robot's video and the words that she wants you to say appear on the screen. And you get your webcam running at the same time and you record yourself. So you wait for her to speak and then you see your line on the screen and then you say it and you simulate a dialogue, right? And then the system generates a score based on how well you said those lines. What do you study? I study social science. And you, what program are you in? I am in accounting and management. Do you like your program? I don't know yet. It's my first semester. I was expecting you to say, I'm in accounting and management. Listen and repeat each word. I'm in accounting. And management, right. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, there the lines are already made for you, right? So you're just saying, you're reading aloud the lines that simulates a conversation, but it's not a real conversation. How about an AI powered conversation? Well, here's a, a, a new feature that I'm working on for labodanglais.com. And it's an AI powered conversation. And what you'll see is a robot waiting uh, for you to ask a question. You ask any question you want, anything. And if you ask it correctly, she'll answer. If you ask it incorrectly, she'll correct you. And uh, I see this as a big jump forward in homework because you get to practice your speaking at home or in the lab. So here's the video. I can answer 20 different questions. Where did you went? You have an error in your question formation. Don't say, where did you went? Instead, say. Where did you go? Where did you go? I went to Ottawa, the capital of Canada. 
It's in Ontario. How were you getting there? That's an awkward way to ask the question. Don't say, how were you getting there? Instead say, how did you get there? How did you get there? We went by car. My father drove. All right. I All right, so that simulates a conversation with a robot. It's a bit wooden, but uh, like it's a bit choppy. But you get to practice your grammar. You get to make all those mistakes that you make in class, but you get feedback from the system. Now, all of this should practice, should prepare students for real conversation, don't you think? And um, that's difficult because in our classrooms, we ask students to have inauthentic conversations. Prac your francophone, you speak to the francophone sitting next to you in English, even though you could express yourself a lot better in, in, uh, in French, in your first language. But we're going to do it because it's English class. All right, but what if the only language you could speak is the target language? Now, check this out. Here you see two students, one student from Vanier on the left. He's an Anglo from Vanier College and a student of Philippe Gagné, my, my colleague over at Vanier. And then on the right, you see uh, a Francophone student uh, who's learning English as a second language here at Ahansi College. And what we did is we scheduled our lab times at the same time so that when they went into the lab, they could talk to each other. And we used a website called World Chat Live, developed by my uh, friend and colleague, Anne-Marie Lafortune. And uh, it's really great because the Anglophone got to practice his French and the Francophone got to practice her English. Now, after they'd done that a few times, we told them schedule a meeting on World Chat Live for homework. Now homework becomes authentic, authentic language practice. Now just watch their conversation. It's very telling. Do you have a question? <laughs> um, like do you film stuff or is it just? Uh... Um, by in the program we um, we make a short film. Uh, oh, okay. Every session. Uh, no, is ah, uh, can't see it. <laughs> I'm not good in English. No, it's so, so okay. Isn't that wonderful? They're, they're actually struggling to make themselves understood and they're asking each other for help. I mean, this is what education should be. It should be social. Okay, so I'll just, that brings me to the end of what I have to say and um, it's really the end of my talk. I'll just remind you, you have homework to do. And the homework is to explain the ideas you heard in this talk today with a colleague. And uh, I've given you resources for you to use. You've got the PowerPoint if you want to use it and uh, you're welcome to it in any context, in any way. Um, if you wanna read about the social brain, I highly recommend the first book by Matthew Lieberman. Um, it's called Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect. And also, I recommend any of the books by John Hattie. He's got a series called Visible Learning, but uh, I really like the first one from 2009, Visible Learning, a synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses uh, relating to achievement. He's written more since, but I, I strongly recommend this one. All right, that's um, everything I have to say. Contact me. You can find me here, nicholas.walker at uh, Collège Ahansik. Um, if you go to Virtual Writing Tutor or labodanglais.com, you'll find an email that'll come to me also. And there's a phone number too, if you want to pick up a phone, send me a text message or give me a call. I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna hear from you and uh, that's the end. Thank you very much. Do, do you have any questions for me? Thank you very much, Nicholas, for your insightful talk, um, a, a lot of food for thought, a lot of um, thoughts to be shared with others as well. And uh, I think the um, 
the examples at the end made it all uh, so clear as to what we should aim for as as teachers. So I, I definitely uh, got some inspiration there already uh, for my own teaching practice. So thanks for that. Um, if there are any other questions, we haven't received uh, any questions so far, please do not hesitate uh, to type them in the Q&A, the QER module. Um, in the meantime, I will also share the link to the appreciation survey. Um, you will also receive this link by email. Um, and if you could take a few moments to complete it, uh, we would very much appreciate it. Um, in the chat, I see uh, lots of messages thanking you, uh, Nick, saying that it uh, was a very inspiring um, presentation, should be mandatory for each teacher, um, very inspiring. So um, if we're not getting any questions at the moment, I guess that is because, well, first of all, it was very clear. And second of all, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of food for thought there, um, a lot of uh, things to 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 let sink in. Um, but you There's did give your email. The chapter module. Sorry? So I want people, uh, Emily Cook, uh, ask a question in the... Oh, yes. Perfect. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Emily asks, I'm looking on ways to make my listening comprehension evaluations more authentic, while also hitting higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So she's wondering if you've got any ideas on that. Hmm. Well, I think the virtual dialogue where you can query uh, there's a, an Asian woman with long hair. And so I asked her, where did you go or where did you went? Right. And she corrected me. And so I, I was forced to correct my grammar and ask, where did you go? She said she went to Ottawa, but we could prepare um, our writing assignment. Okay. Now send an email to a friend uh, about what we'll call, what should we call her? Um, Sandy has to say, about her trip, she went to Ottawa, her father drove, right? And uh, so you use this system to collect the information in an interactive way, and then you report the information in an email, and then possibly have the system score it for you. Or if you really like to score it by hand, you could do that. It, it's one idea. Thank you very much. We uh, get another question from Anjosi. Uh, if I understand correctly, you said that the information brain and social brain don't work together and or at the same time. Uh, so could you give us some more precisions about that? Um, she's not sure why it's not possible. Well, I think, uh, so I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just a teacher who's passionate about learning and improving my, my teaching. So I'm getting these ideas from the neuroscience community, um, specifically from this book called Social, How Our Brains Are Wired to Connect by Matthew Lieberman. And I, I, I think it's just simply a fact that when you put someone into an F, a functional MRI machine, a magnetic uh, resonance imaging machine, when you uh, ask people to recall information or to listen to a series of information points, uh, certain regions of their brain, they light up, let's say parts here. But when you ask them to hear information that's got a social context, then like different areas of the brain light up. And so it's, they don't light up simultaneously, even if there is uh, information embedded in the story uh, about the, the person in the social context. So we just see it physically, they're separate. Uh, we, they don't light up at the same time. So therefore one is dormant while the other one is active, and vice versa. Why that is, I'm not sure, but it has a uh, profound, maybe the brain just cannot run both algorithms 
both uh, systems at the same time. Our brains are, are limited in bandwidth, perhaps. But I'll tell you what, uh, so many teachers focus on this information transfer and the information brain. And I see it even in the most popular website for language learning in the world with, uh, you know, over like 500 million subscribers, uh, Duolingo. It's all about information. It's not about conversations. Very little of it is conversation. Uh, we, we, we offer students puzzles. And uh, after 20,000 hours of education, they don't remember very much. Perfect. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and Jose says thank you. She's a neuroscience teacher, so that's why she's asked. Oh. And she will she will uh, look into it further and um, refer to the the resources you you shared. Um, in the meantime, we uh, got some more thank you messages in the chat. So uh, I do uh, recommend that you you check that out afterward, Nicholas, to uh, to see uh, all the the kind words and uh, messages of thanks. And um, if we don't have any other questions, then I will just take this opportunity to uh, thank you once again, and to let everybody know that next week's uh, webinar will be Sherpa Plus, Soto Formé pour accompagner des stagiaires. Uh, so if you're interested in that, it will be available with simultaneous translation uh, into English. Um, so please don't hesitate to sign up uh, if you're interested. Thank you everybody so much for taking precious time out of your day. Uh, to attend this webinar, and uh, we do hope that we'll see you on another occasion sometime soon.